acknowledgement to start. Are we ready to? All right, what, why don't we get going here for our uh, breakout session number two today. This is about uh, patient engagement. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jeff Hitchcock. I run an organization called Children with Diabetes. We offer education and support to families living with type one, like ours. My daughter, Marissa, who is now 35, was diagnosed at 24 months. Some of the team from Stanford and other places know her. But it's been, it's been very interesting for me to be part of this collaborative to see, one, how hard it is to affect change in the healthcare system. So I, I stand in awe of all of you. But I, I want to give you two little bits of a, a sort of perspective. You've all heard that um, if you're not at the table, you're on the table. You know, So you want to be part of that. But in the diabetes online community, we also say nothing about us without us. So as you look to affect change within your clinics to improve outcomes for the patients and families you serve, bring us in. There will be people in your, in your clinic, in your community who would love to participate so that we can share our perspectives on how to, how to make a difference. So with that said, let's, uh, let me introduce our first uh, speaker, uh, Dean Mohandas uh, from Stanford. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dean. I'm the current QI coordinator at Stanford. I'm here with Dr. Bethina, our PI, and I'm going to be talking um, about our project on improving our mental health screening process. Oh, sorry. Is this better? No. Is it not on? I can talk a little louder, too. Is this better? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay, I'm Dean. I'm the QI coordinator at Stanford. Um, I'm here with our PI, Dr. Christina, and I'll be talking about our current project on improving mental health screening in our clinic. So just um, a little bit of background or context. Um, as I said, I'm Dean. Um, this project was actually started with our previous coordinator, Jacob, who is here today. Um, so our clinic, we have uh, 16 attendings, five fellows, three nurse practitioners, five diabetes educators, a nutritionist, and a DM psychologist um, who is part-time. So we have about 1,700 established patients and about 30 to 45 new patients every year. So um, by this project, so as we know, um, there are psychosocial implications with type 1 diabetes and a higher prevalence of depression and anxiety and other mental health challenges with individuals with type 1. So prior to 2021, Stanford actually didn't have any established system for routine mental health screening in our endocrine clinic. So that same year in winter 2021, Stanford Healthcare set a goal to implement mental health screening and also develop um, a system for referrals and resources for any patients who we could support. So our aim statement was to increase our regular mental health screening for depression and anxiety in our adult patients who are being seen at the endocrine clinic using PHQ 2 to 8, as well as GAD 7. Our goal was to increase from our baseline, which was 0% to 50% screening for a single provider within the first six months. So from June 2021 to, sorry, from December 2021 to June 2022. And then our goal was to involve any other interested providers in the clinic um, and have them have a 50% screening rate within the next six months, so a total of 12 months from the beginning, so by December 2022. So when we started, we started with a little bit of baseline screening. So we did our baseline screening with 16 patients. So 16 patients were assigned surveys. Um, of these 16, we had 14 responses. There were two elevated scores, so two patients had a moderately elevated GAD7, and the remaining scores were all um, within normal range, so not elevated. Um, two patients did not complete any of the assigned surveys. So in addition to our baseline screening, we also um, came up with a fishbone diagram to help come up with our workflow. So I know there's a lot of words, I'm not going to read all of them but just some of the basics. So who are the people that were mainly involved in this project? So our medical provider, our DM psychologist, um, as I mentioned before, she does have a limited schedule. So just two half days per week and our QI coordinator. Um, you may know we don't have a social worker. So that's definitely one of the limitations in terms of resources. There's only one social worker who works in the 
ED um, and just did not have the capacity to support our clinic as well. So kind of going off of that, this definitely influenced our screening and um, our workflow. So in terms of screening tools, we are currently using PHQ 2 to 8. Um, we omitted question 9, the question with screens for suicidal ideation, um, because our clinic does not currently have the capacity to respond like effectively or timely. So we're just not able to support those patients. Um, and then we also did discuss using diabetes distress screening questionnaire. However, this questionnaire can be quite long. So we decided for now to not include it in the hopes that having a shorter survey would encourage more patients to fill out our surveys. Um, and right now, the only place where we are assigning our surveys is on Epic. We have a lot of patients who only do telemedicine and only are seen virtually in clinic. So for us, assigning these surveys virtually via Epic and My Health Messaging um, made the most sense. So here is our workflow, and it has we've like adjusted it a little as we've gone. So right now, one week prior to the visit, our tri coordinator, and now that's me, will assign surveys. So all patients, all type one patients are assigned surveys, with the exception of patients who were recently screened or or who are being closely followed by another mental health provider or their PCP for um, mental health support. So if a patient did not fill out the surveys, uh, we send them a reminder message and we send them the surveys again. And then if they have still not completed the surveys by the time of their appointment, we'll make a note and reassign them for their next visit. If they did fill out the survey um, and they have no elevated score, great. Um, we will send them a My Health message on Epic, thanking them for completing our surveys and providing them with a crisis number um, just for support. If they had moderately elevated scores for either the PHQ 2 to 8 or GAD 7, we again offer our resources first through a My Health message. So we will offer them resources for therapy, counseling, as well as some information on how to navigate through their insurance if they're looking for insurance coverage. Um, and we offer a direct referral for a one-time visit with our DM psychologist. Um, if they have severely elevated scores, we also offer our direct referral to our DM psychologist and in our My Health message include options for psychiatry information. And for all elevated scores during the visit, um, the provider will discuss the scores, um, again, offer resources, talk about our DM psychologist. And I will say a lot of our patients are really excited and interested in meeting with our DM psychologist, especially once they hear that she focuses on type one and has a lot of experience working with patients with type one. Um, and for all of our elevated scores, we send a My Health message follow up in two weeks. We're just trying to see were patients able to access our resources? How is that process for them? Do they still need support? Are they still looking for resources and are they interested? So here we have just a fun chart of our combined responses for our screenings for PH2, 2 to 8, as well as GAD7. Um, the trends are pretty similar. We found that it's kind of an all or nothing. If a patient is going to answer our surveys, they'll usually do both of them. So um, when, I'll just go through some of the PDSA cycles kind of quickly. So our PDSA cycles are about our two weeks. So in the beginning, we were only assigning um, surveys to some of our patients just to kind of get an idea of our workflow and make adjustments as needed. Um, so then in cycle three, we increased and assigned surveys to all of our patients. So we did see kind of a dip in our response rate. And then in the middle, we were seeing can we get a better response rate if we increase the amount of time patients have? So if we assign surveys two weeks in advance, send them more reminders, um, it didn't really work. So we went back to just one week. Um, and then in cycle six, we actually had the most responses and we also had the most positive screens. So we had four positive screens in one week. So that really encouraged us to go back and see how can we better support our patients with elevated scores? How can we you know, get them more help and respond more efficiently? Um, so for cycle seven and eight, based on some patient feedback we got from cycle six, we started, instead of just sending resources in like a gigantic block of text into my health message, we started sending it as a PDF attachment um, to make it a little bit easier to read. And as we continued, we were really trying to see how can we increase responses from patients who read our surveys and don't respond, and also from patients who just 
don't read our messages. So we started sending reminders to everyone to see if that would help a little bit. Um, and then more recently, coming to cycle 11 and 12, we were discussing and trying to work on moving some of our data to REDCap to help with analysis um, and just better figure out ways, like places we can make changes and improvements. We also have been changing our messaging and our wording, trying to see can we give people like an estimate of how long it will take and provide concrete examples of why this is important for their care. So just to summarize, currently our response rate is 55.7%, so definitely increased from a baseline of zero. Um, we've had 19 patients with a positive screen. And so this is currently our screening rate for, for one provider. Um, yeah. So as you can see, about 10% positive screens. So where are we going next? We want to continue reaching out to other providers in our clinic to gauge their interest and see if we can also start getting some of their patients. Um, we're still working on our workflow and our referral systems to more efficiently and quickly connect patients with resources and the support that they need. We're also still working on ways to improve how we're assigning surveys and work on automating things. I you know, was out of the office for a week and our screen rates kind of dipped because there was no one to continually assign surveys. And that's not ideal. We want this to be a sustainable project. Um, and finally, we want to continue reaching out to patients who were not screened and seeing how we can reduce barriers and um, make it easier to hear from them. Thank you. So we'll, we'll take questions now. Um, we've got like five minutes. Um, and if you would just repeat any questions that are asked. Sure. Hi, very nice presentation. I have a question. I'm a pediatric endocrinologist, so I recognize the workflow is very different in the adult clinics. Um, but have you asked, I don't know which EHR you have, if they can just build the um, uh, tool in so that it recognizes, like we've been able to so, uh, put it in so it fires um, every three months standardly. Um, and if you haven't been seen in the past three months and you have a visit upcoming, it'll automatically go into your my chart or my health to get to you. Sure. Um, so I'll just repeat the question. The question was, could we automate reminders for screening and have it be built in? So we're using Epic right now. Um, that would be lovely. I wish we could do that. Our system doesn't currently do so that. You just need one of those data analysts to help. Yeah, you. we're working on an epic request. They take a really long time. Um, it, it does have opportunity, but what we, the harder part was getting it built as a flow sheet, then goes into my chart, and you don't have the ninth question, so it should be no problem assigning it ahead of time. And um, and then it automatically knows it's nine because you haven't had this screen, and it would do it a week in advance if that's how you programmed it. This would be so you wouldn't have to do it by hand. Yeah, that would be lovely. It can yeah. be done if you have yeah. someone help you. Thank you. That's for another little bit. Right. The same thing to change in Epic. It doesn't ever couple of years. This was given to me for both doing telemedicine visits and person, but uh, did you look at the distribution of responses to patients who either came in or just did it by telemedicine? Because you know, when a patient is sitting in the office and they're waiting for us, you know, that's also another opportune time to give them a survey. So did you look at some of the distribution? Um, we haven't looked very specifically, but just from like what I can remember, we do get more responses from patients who come in person, even though the responses, even though the surveys are sent electronically. Yes. Or if it's yeah, that's definitely something we're working on. So, oh, sorry. The question was, um, how do we deal with patients who either don't have my chart or who, for whom English is not their first language? Um, so that's definitely something that we're working on. So fortunately, I would say only about one in every 30 or 40 patients doesn't have my chart. Um, as far as non-English speaking, we currently are only giving our surveys in English, but it would definitely be amazing to be able to assign them in other languages. Um, I only speak English. Yeah. yeah. 
by another provider. Um, because that's also helpful. We mm -hmm. found that not everyone follows in the same institution if they come to our diabetes clinic. Yeah. And certainly we share names for another. Because again, that's redundancy. So sometimes mm -hmm. they won't answer your survey, but they answer someone else's the one yeah, so the question was, do we check if they've been screened by someone else in our system? Yes. So we do check. Um, we like look through all their other records. And if the records are available and they have been screened by someone else, we don't assign surveys. So we are definitely trying not to be redundant. And Bill can also do that. Just as a staff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, definitely only trying to assign surveys to patients who would not have other been why it's been screened. I have one question from the chat box. <clears throat> Do you ever utilize the ADA mental health directory to find a suitable therapist? Um, not currently, but that's a great suggestion. We don't currently use the ADA registry, but we should. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, let me see if I can, uh, while we're here, I'm gonna try to get rid of this, at least hide that. Can we actually stop sharing. All right. I'm going to stop sharing. Sharing. All and right. Let it to Angel. Angel, let her to. I should. I share my. I'll let you drive. Okay. That looks good. I think. Angel, can you? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear? Can Ooh, you hear right. me? We're gonna hold on one second. We're going to increase your volume. Okay. And should I share my slides or? All right. Yes, I think you have screen share. Okay. It's all, it's all in your hands. All right. Okay. Let me make sure you guys. Um. Do you all see my slide? And can you all hear me well? Um, can you increase the volume of the audio? Hold on. All right, Angel. Hi, Once can you hear me? Sorry. All right, thanks. Is that better? Is that a little bit better? Yes, you're good. Go ahead. Okay, and then you'll be able to see my screen as well. I just want to make sure. Yes, we see your screen. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Hi, Um. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Angel. I'm um, the pediatric endocrinologist uh, at UCSF, one of the QI director at UCSF Pediatric Endocrinology. Very um, nice to meet you, everyone, virtually. And thank you for the opportunity for me to present our project on um, the improvement in screening for diabetes, um, for depression in adolescents with diabetes. So as we all know that depression and mental health um, problems are very common among adolescents, particularly um, in patients with chronic health conditions such as diabetes. And it is associated with some optimal diabetes outcomes with high hemoglobin one c and increased rates of diabetes related hospitalizations. And you know, the standards of care obviously is recommend routine psychosocial screening for patients with diabetes. And however, the depression screening rates of adolescents with either type 1 and type 2 diabetes were only 29% and 35% in 2019 and 2020, respectively, in our institute, which include two primary diabetes clinic sites. So mental health evaluation were not routinely done uh, for all our patients or with the use of a validated screening tool in our clinics before. And so this is the sort of the um the data showing the the percentage of pa uh, patient being you know asked about you know depression symptoms in year 2019 and 2020. So why patients with diabetes in our institutes are not systemically screened for depression and why does the problem exist? This is a fishbone fish diagram that we try to look into the causes of the problem and try to help us to. Uh, you know, um, figure out some of the interventions. So um, again, I'm not going to go through every single details of this fishbone diagram, but um, essentially it is multifactorial with uh, limitation in resources, including supporting staff and social worker, um, different screening approaches and workflows that we encounter in various uh, clinic sites particularly the two primary diabetes sites in San Francisco. 
and also limited social work access and support, particularly with telehealth visits during the COVID pandemic. And all these limitations sort of contributed to the challenges of screening adolescents with diabetes routinely in our institute. But as I mentioned, um, we do feel like this is a very important you know, aspect um, to look into. So our project goal is to achieve 50% or more depression screening for adolescents for all diabetes um, in-person encounters for at least nine out of 12 months in fiscal year 2022. And more globally, we aim to adequately address the psychosocial needs of patients with positive depression screens with the goal to improve patient engagement with their diabetes care, quality of life, and reduce diabetes-related complications. So our interventions include um, forming a multidisciplinary task force, including providers, social workers, office assistants, practice administrators, and diabetes educators um, to review the updated literatures and develop guidelines and clinic workflows. We also constructed the key driver diagrams to try to look at the different primary drivers and also um, the corresponding, and the corresponding interventions. So we identify three primary drivers um, sort of like to help improve the, the aim that I mentioned, um, including use of a consistent screening method and referral uh, criteria. Um, we think it's important to use a validated screening tool and algorithm for referral. And we adopted the PHQ-9 depression screen. It has been validated in adolescents um, with uh, diabetes. And at the same time, our in intervention also like um, adopt to use the electronic medical record for consistent documentation, because part of that um, depends on different clinic sites and may use different weight of documentation. So we wanted to be consistent across different clinic sites mm -hmm. to use the um, electronic medical record. And throughout the, um, the process, we also think that the integration of the screening into the clinic flow is important to minimize any interruptions and also involving, it's important to involve all the clinic staff, patients and providers and the whole process of design and also um, the workflows. So um, our intervention includes to have clinic staff and also providers to be part of the multidisciplinary team to come up with the clinic workflow. And ultimately, after increasing the, um, the screening for depressions, we hope to have increased the referral to our social work uh, appropriately and sort of in the future intervention um, based on the numbers of referrals that hopefully we may be able to um, ask for more like, you know, staffing and resources to support the social needs for our patients. So these are the three primary drivers. So um, I will talk a little bit more detail about our clinic, oh, sorry, the clinic workflows. Um, so patients aged 13 to 17 with either types, type one or type two diabetes um, will be um, for the in-person visit or identified for depression screening. So either social work transition coordinator or the front desk will distribute a screening form either in English and Spanish, depending on the, which language the family speak after the patients were checked uh, in the clinic. And patient will complete the screening in the waiting room and we make sure that uh, patient is, it, um, a patient will do the screening in a safe environment to ensure confidentiality. And once the screening is completed, medical system will help input the score into the electronic medical record for providers or social work to review the results together with the patients later on during the visit. And follow-up actions depend on the screening scores. We sort of categorize based on the score into low or mild, moderate or severe depression. And if patients score positive to suicidality, that is the question number nine, so social work will be immediately notified uh, for evaluation to make sure patients are safe before going home after the visit of the day. 
Again, we also created a list of the mental health resources included, included the crisis hotline um, to be provided for all patients on their after visit summary after the visits um, was done for the day. So this is sort of the of the flow ch chart um, that listed, you know, the um, the workflow that how we incorporate and implement the um, the screening in our office. So here's the timeline of our project. The first PDSI cycle was commenced in March 2021, and then data was reviewed every one to two weeks after implementing the project for adjustment and finalized um, the project was launched in July. And more details are shown in this run chart. And again, so the white zone sort of like indicating the, um, the time frame that the project was before the start of the project. And then the, the gray areas is um, the time frame after the project was launched. And we can see um, in terms of like the percentage of patients get like depression screening before and after the project. Um, so we started the uh, project in fiscal year 2021 um, since June, and soon after the project was implement, uh, implemented, and there was a noticeable increase in the depression screening rate, and we first achieved uh, over 50% of screening rate a, a month after the start of the project. And as you can see, the blue line here is sort of the um, the, the monthly screening rates and the screening rates have been maintained over 50% until September, that it drops slightly to 47%. Um, that's because the screening has stopped uh, in one of the clinic sites due to the lack of the social work support. Here's another point in January 2022 that the depression screen rate has dropped significantly down to um, less than 20%, and that's due to the COVID Omicron surge, that most of the patient visits were converted to telehealth. At this point, our depression screening was not done via the telehealth due to the concerns for patient safety and confidentiality. So we only offer screening for patients who come to uh, the office visits, and that's the reason here there's a significant drop due to the increase in the telehealth um, visit. And in February, um, after we revising the screening workflow in one of the, um, the, the DM site, that the screening no longer dependent on the presence of the on-site social works. So essentially, even without the social work like being in the clinic at that point, we still have the front line, um, the front desk or the medical assistant help to distribute this questionnaire. And, uh, and the screening was resumed. Um, back in March in that site. And then ever since then, we noticed the, um, the screening rates continues to improve and be maintained over 50% um, percent for the rest of the fiscal year 2022. And our cumulative screening rate so far was uh, 56%. So here are the results. So from the run chart sort of like um, clearly showed that the depression screening rates were achieved over 50% in eight out of the 12 months in fiscal 2022. Um, though we did not achieve what we originally um, planned, which is nine out of the 12 months. However, the cumulative screening rates was 56%. And the rate has improved significantly by 27% over the baseline. So in conclusions, adolescents with diabetes are now routinely screened at least annually at in-person visit at the two primary sites at uh, UCSF and the Children Clinic with a standardized workflow and also a screening tool. Patients are then referred to clinic social worker based on their screening results criteria. Of course, uh, we do encounter, you know, several limitations uh, when we, um, you know, implementing our projects, one being in-person interventions were pretty, um, pretty much impacted by the increased use of telehealth visits due to, due to the COVID pandemic. And as of 
now, as I mentioned, that uh, due to the concern of like, patient safety and confidentiality, we only offer the screening uh, for all the office visits. And also um, frequent staff changings during the whole process um, require ongoing training to new coming you know, staff, members, and of course, like limitations and in resources, including limited social work, support, and also medical staff, and also lack of the electronic version of the screening tool, because right now we are still using the paper form. We're still having some challenges of converting to like an electronic form of the screening tool has been always like, you know, um, contributing um, limitation to the uh, project. However, we strongly believe that depression screen or the psychosocial screening is very important for patients with diabetes. So our future direction, moving the next steps, we definitely consider to increase the screening population to all patients over 13 years of age. Um, because in our clinic, we still see some patients up till the age of like 21 to 22. So there's like a gap of patients that did not receive the screening when they come to the visit. And we do believe for young adults, it's um, mental health um, issues and psychosocial needs is also always an, an important issue to discuss. And we also consider to screen um, via telehealth visits. Um, so we have ongoing conversation with our team as well as the social work um, to member to come up with a, um, a doable workflow to screen patients uh, with telehealth visits. And um, apart from the two primary main sites, uh, we also have some other satellite clinics that we do think that expanding the depression screening workflow to the satellite clinics are important to provide equitable, equitable care for all patients with diabetes. And more logistically, we're also working, try to like be able to um, able to administer the screening electronically so that the result can be automatically and directly populated into the uh, APAC system. So this is the, the end of my uh, presentation and I really have to have a big shout out to the whole uh, QI team and also the depression uh, screening task force members. And um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. I think we have time for, for one question. Uh, do we have one from the chat first? If not, do we have any questions from the room? We have one. If you, if you would come up and, and just use the microphone, that'd be easier. Hi, everybody. I'm Naomi Sullivan from Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. Um, and I think, you know, like Stanford and like everybody else were, we actually do auto assign ours in Epic, um, like you were talking about. And, but our problem is that we don't have the MyChart uptake. I think that a lot of places might, and our MyChart just went in Spanish. So outside of that, we just don't have any options. And so I think it's really fascinating that you have your MAs translate the paper into Epic. We've talked about that, but the MAs juggle so many things right now with like device downloads and all the other tasks. So I kind of just want to hear from anybody about, we're really struggling with this topic. We have tried so many different things, but I think it's just like so many limitations like you talked about. Um, so kind of pose that to everybody, but um, I think that we've just uh, really, and I, I, I personally feel like it's what we're doing right now is not very equitable. Like we're probably getting results and um, things from our upper middle class technology driven users. And we're probably missing a huge subset of patients that really need the screening. So that's my kind of post question to everybody. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I mean, that's also like, you know, throughout the whole process, we do encounter a lot of like, you know, limitation and pushback from the team. And so this is really a team collaboration to have like, um, you know, have the MA, the front desk, like, you know, everybody like in the team be able to help to support this projects. And um, and I totally agree with you that we also feel like even though we are able to screen patient coming to the office, we also feel like we're not, you know, doing the best of like, you know, screening everybody they have come to the visit. And, and also one of the challenges that we are trying hard to try to like, you know, overcome is to help to incorporate like 
using the electronic tool instead of just like the paper form. So I love to hear like from other like center if they are doing the same like screening, like how do they come up with, you know, overcome that problem? Um, because I do think this is an area that's important for everybody, but um, there's still a lot to do. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. We're, we're going to move on to our next session, increasing patient engagement through the use of online diabetes questionnaire with Stephanie and Candace from Cooks, Texas. Can everyone hear me okay? A little more short. I'm Stephanie. I'm one of the diabetes educators in our clinic and um, diabetes coordinator. Uh, Candace is one of our nurse practitioners, and Dr. Awazir, Dr. Shea, they were not able to be here, but we work all together. And then Kristen, one of our other nurses, she's actually presenting about SDOH right now. So um, this is kind of our entire team at the moment, and we do this as we have a moment. So we are still new to QI, but we are thoroughly enjoying it. Lovely to be here. So um, our key diagram driver, we picked a, a patient-centered uh, primary driver to assess patient concerns uh, for visits, as well as increase staff time for the actual visit. So the provider would have more time to address questions from the family or any concerns that have come up, of course, review blood sugars, but allow more time for those things that needed to be done without asking our general do you pre-meal dose, do you post-meal dose, those sorts of things. So we found that trying to ask these questions ahead of time allowed for more visit time. Um, so as a background, our online health questionnaires engage patients in care and increase efficiency of um, cl clinician time and utilization of the online diabetes questionnaire or ODQ by patients with type 1 diabetes prior to their clinic visit was approximately 37%. So not very high. Um, and our objective was to improve the utilization of the online diabetes questionnaire and aim to increase from the baseline by 10% at one of our satellite clinics. Um, this particular clinic was in Hearst. We have nine satellite locations that we telemed to. So at this particular site in Hearst, we have one nurse practitioner, which is Candace, and we have um, two doctors that are there, as well as two MAs that are always there. The rest of our staff is telemed, which would be one social worker, um, three clinical therapists, four dietitians, 10 diabetes educators, two of them have their CDCS, and um, we have two child life specialists, one inpatient, one outpatient. So if needed, they would telemed to that location for further um, information that was needed. And in this clinic, um, we picked this clinic particularly because we had a high MyChart usage there just to see what worked for patients that were already utilizing MyChart. And this clinic also did not have any Medicaid kids, which is quite out of the norm for our other satellite clinics, including our main location in Fort Worth, which is upper end of 50% um, Medicaid. So this was just to get an idea of what works, what didn't work and uh, pretty much almost 100% type one as well, um, where our other locations are 40 to 50% type two in some locations. So our methods for this with patients with upcoming visit um, have access to electronic health portal, which was my chart. They would pre-fill the ODQ online um, in regards to insulin dosing, carb counting and goals or any questions they have. Um, in addition, there were some families that sent an additional MyChart message with other questions or I'm not really wanting my child to know about my question. Can you somehow bring this information up? So that was one thing that I think we could add a, an other section in somehow um, as we did get some of those questions as well. But assessment of barriers related to the survey completion, we had a barrier survey that we provided families after their visit or 
during their visit if they did complete the questionnaire. Um, and if they didn't complete the questionnaire, kind of a different subset of questions to figure out what were those barriers from keeping them um, for filling that questionnaire out. So 37.5% of patients didn't know the ODQ existed. Um, so that kind of told us they're not looking at their MyChart messages. Potentially, was it notification fatigue? What was that? Um, what was it looking like? So 25% of patients forgot to complete it. And um, so going forward, we'll kind of go through each PDSA. So in cycle one, our main objective and goal was to improve patient knowledge by 20%. So with our first PDSA cycle, we sent a MyChart message one week prior to the visit. That was all manually done. It wasn't pre-populated. So I would do that generally on a Friday afternoon and try to get that out um, for patients to complete. And that went on for eight weeks. It does sound like a long time, but initially we started with one of our doctors in Hearst. So encounters um, ended up being 11 encounters total, um, which we found improved participation with that. But then we also found that notification fatigue because 70% of patients didn't even read the MyChart message. Um, and of course, that small percentage of patients or small population size. So for PDSA-2, we called this our late intervention. So it was about four days prior to the visit that we sent a message and included specific education and why that ODQ is a benefit for the family um, to help address those concerns at the visit and not just go through a list of questions. And so this was 18 encounters. We did find that there was a decreased participation in um, filling out the questionnaire. There was an increased awareness of it that we figured out through the barriers survey. Um, so further notification fatigue. And then this is when Texas had the lovely ice storm in 2021. And we had a lot of cancellations um, for a week to two weeks because of that. And um, at this time as well, I was on maternity leave. So Candace was the, the sole person trying to send these MyChart messages out at that point. Um, so I did forget to mention in PDSA 1 that um, percentage increase was 54%. So we went up from 38% to 54% and then back down to 37.2%, which was not great. But we learned a lot from this uh, PDSA cycle. So in PDSA 3, we utilized a um, medical receptionist reminder. So they would at check-in look to see if the ODQ had been completed. And if not, they would remind the family to do that. So we used human interaction to help reduce that notification fatigue. And then also expanded to two additional providers. So we then had two doctors and one nurse practitioner that we got all of these data points from. So at this point, we had 66 total encounters. Of course, increased participation from that. We still had notification fatigue, but it was reduced because of the human interaction of that aspect. And then the new barrier was that 36% of the patients didn't have time to do the ODQ. So we went back up to 45% on PDSA-3. And then for PDSA-4, um, we utilized the medical assistant to remind families if we got to the point of in the exam room, it may rem or excuse me, the medical receptionist reminded them at check-in. If they still didn't complete it, then the MA com reminded the family at that point to complete it. So they were given more time to complete that questionnaire and um, utilize that visit time more effectively. So we had total of 52 encounters for this um, cycle, we had improved participation and we met our goal of 58% at that point. So we increased by that 20% and um, reduced barrier of time for completion because they had that in waiting room and waiting in the exam room time frame. How this would look in our other clinics is what we're kind of looking at next because we know that this clinic in particular has a high MyChart usage. Um, and not a lot of Medicaid population. So our, our barriers are going to be a little bit different, but what we hope to gain from it is what worked there with that um, set of patients and how we can utilize potential online reminders um, in addition to human interaction. So we know those online reminders are going to be less effective and lead to notification fatigue, but do we do both or not? Um, would the most effective method be on-site reminders and to effectively use that time? Yes, we do believe that. 
how we could implement that to a tablet at check-in. Um, we do have another set of our clinic that does use welcome tablets. It's more of our type two clinic and they're kind of piloting, piloting that right now. So that's something that we hope we can use as well in the future. And um, I think our, we have a new building that's opening and we have a, um, it's called a tech zone. So that's something that we're also hoping we can maybe utilize is that families can potentially do that questionnaire there when they're downloading devices or that sort of thing. Um, so expanding to all of our locations, which approximately is about 1400 patients with type one diabetes, these were pre-COVID numbers, and last year we had a significant increase in patients, but also it was about almost like a 50-50 split of type 1 and type 2, which type 2 significantly increased, partly we think because of COVID, but um, we expect those numbers to be slightly higher um, for total. And the application of SDOH criteria to improve participation and access to technology, language barriers, and education. So this barrier survey was only in English. We had a very, very small population of Spanish speakers in this Hearst clinic as well. And so it promotes our benefit of ODQ participation to the patient, which is a patient first approach, family centered, and trying to get any um, effective use of time. Any questions? Oh, I'm so sorry. So um, what we should do is kind of scheduling maybe the post when they say you kind of eight o'clock and the same, but they the same they do the same, but maybe that's longer. But this is manual, and so it's some way with also okay, and are you guys doing this when in person only or are you doing it not in exactly the right? Sure. So um, this question was is is it is any of it um in person only or is it also in person? All of these encounters were in person. Um, we do more in person than even during COVID, we still did a lot in person versus virtual, um, but all of these were in person only. So that is another aspect of if we could have, we have the ability to do it online, the families just didn't do it. So our, our telehealth visits were actually where the family had to go into my chart to begin the visit. So that is almost a, as a pro factor of it because they are already in my chart, they can see that questionnaire pop up. I think what we did find out is that there were there was the COVID, COVID questionnaire, then we had our diabetes questionnaire, and then you have your normal any update questionnaire. There's like 50,000 questionnaires before you can even get to a point that you can begin the visit. Um, so I think some providers um, in our Fort Worth location would just start the visit because they're like, I can't wait any longer, which I totally understand. Um, but that that is a big, big thing is it was all manual um, for this project if they didn't fill it out online. And going back, yeah. Candace also has probably a little bit more on that. So it was like perfect that this talk went after the last one. There's a couple like institution requirements that our hospital does. They always send something a week before the visit in three days. It's automatic. It's blanketed for every specialty. So we kind of added di diabetes specific. Hey, this is good for you and beneficial at your visit. So we're not asking you all the silly questions about your ICR, right? Um, so that helped us. And then a, we dangled a carrot in 2018 when we went live on Epic. We told them they couldn't get their diabetes management plans unless they had a MyTAR access. So I think that was pivotal in getting our initial yeah sign on and then all our new families are like, oh, we want it faxed to the school. No, 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 you have to have my chart access. So I think that helped us. I don't know if it's fair or unfair from SDOH perspective, but it's it's working. So we did provide those families with alternatives. Yeah. <laughs> so we didn't say they couldn't ever have it, but it was a lot easier to get through my chart. So there are benefits, of course, we all know. Um, it's just getting them to use it. And we did say even Hey, if you don't have a computer or you're not able to do it on your phone, would the school nurse allow you to do, um, or we've, that's where the welcome tablets, I think would be very beneficial. Yes, would everybody know how to use them? Probably not. 
but we kind of went back. We had a, a great grandparents taking care of one of our type ones that were in their 90s and they still were on my chart. So I was like, if this great grandparent can do this, I'm pretty sure like we can figure this out one way or another. Of course, we there's different aspects of everything, but um, like Hannah said, that was, I think, a big part of getting families on my chart was this is how you're getting your diabetes management plan for school. Are we going to be able to go over? Because if not, we should stop. Okay, one more question. Um, um, the visit was more effective or shortened because of those surveys. And then you mentioned that patients were able to get more knowledge. Do you have any um, data or any, I, I know it's another survey, but whether that knowledge did improve, whether the patients felt that they had better knowledge and understanding after the visit by doing it. So the question was, was there, what was the patient knowledge increase and how was that beneficial? So I think there was more time with the provider visits. I know Candace will have a lot more specifics on that as she performed the visit, but there were there was more time to discuss those questions and concerns and families then therefore learned about, okay, can we talk more about dose adjustments? Can we talk more about how to use, utilize our pump or CGM in a better way? Um, if we don't have a pump or CGM, what are those steps to, to get that? Um, so I think it, overall, it definitely improved the provider time, but also the patient's education. So if there was more of a need identified, one of the diabetes educators would meet with them on telemed and go through the, the whole list of things that we would need to go through. But um, overall, it did increase. Would they go through specified in order to request from the hospital to do this automation directly give you more data. Yes, our fight is definitely with IT. <laughs> it sounds like across the board it is, but that is the hard part right now. So, of course. All right. As an IT person, I apologize on behalf of my entire profession. All right, Janice. Janice? All right, everyone. Yes. Uh, okay. Should I sh go ahead and share? Let yes, me see. yes, please. All right. So just as a reminder, we have a 10 minute presentation and then a couple minutes at the end for questions. Um, Hold on. And we can hear you and. Yeah, let me. This might take a little, it's going to look a little funny, but hold on. <laughs> uh, Perfect. Looks great. All right. I think the window is the window big enough. No, hold on. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. So I know that we are short on time. Let me get rid of that stuff <laughs> if I can. Um, all right. So thank you. Everyone, I'm trying to go to the start of my presentation. All right, thanks everyone. Um, I'm Janice Wong um, uh, from UCSF Pediatrics. You met my colleague Angel a couple of uh, presentations ago, and um, as a QI director for UCF Peds, I'm happy to speak about what we've done um, to address disparities in glycemic outcomes um, in children with type 1 diabetes, specifically addressing um, what we refer to as tequity as well as peer support. Um, I um, uh, would love to have been there today. I'm sorry I couldn't be there, but in the room today is Katie Kraft, who is one of our team members, and she actually sent me a photo of So even though I can't see all of you, I have seen all of you because Katie sent me um, a text to just prove that they are there in the room. Um, so thanks for bearing with the virtual presentation. So for those of you not familiar with Northern California um, or the Bay Area, I uh, just wanted to show you a little uh, map to show you that uh, UCSF actually um, sees patients um, in all of the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, zooming in a little bit, um, we, uh, our main clinic spanned uh, two sides of the Bay in uh, Oakland and in San Francisco. Uh, in addition, we have a number of satellite clinics all over the San Francisco Bay area. Um, 
we referred to them as the East Bay and the West Bay, and you'll see that on our slides. Just for context, um, on the East Bay um, side of our, our, our population, we have about two thirds of our patients uh, who are publicly insured. It's a, a opposite on their San Francisco side with one third who are publicly insured. Now, in thinking about our QI projects, what we noted um, during, um, uh, as we started this project is the the discrepancy between the mean um, hemoglobin A1C between our publicly and privately insured patients. And shown here, the run charts for East Bay in panel A and West Bay in panel B um, jumps around a little bit month to month, but, but overall the median gap um, for both sides of the bay was 1.3%. Um, and so uh, what, what this, this difference in, sorry, I'm just changing things around so I can see, uh, this difference um, in uh, publicly and public publicly and privately insured patients of 1.3%, um, this more this higher less optimal A1C became the basis of uh, this particular QI initiative. So, our objective for this particular project was to reduce the monthly median A1C gap um, from that baseline of 1.3% um, by 5% to 1.24% between publicly and privately insured children with type 1 diabetes. Um, by the end of December 2021, so this project started in June of 2021, so in the first six months, and then further reduce that by 10% uh, to 1.17% in the last three months of the fiscal year uh, 2022, April through June, without either population's median A1C increasing above that baseline of 1.3%. Um, and the global aim was to achieve health equity uh, for children with diabetes seen at Benioff Children's Hospitals. So to address these goals, we did form a multidisciplinary task force um, in May of 2021. Our task force was uh, comprised of educators, um, including uh, nurses, uh, dietitians, social workers, our transition coordinator, Katie, who's in the room, um, nurse practitioners, um, and uh, physicians, as well as Barbara Leitman, who is on the call virtually as well, who is our fantastic nurse quality coordinator. Um, so this multidisciplinary group conducted gap analysis. So we created cause and effect diagrams or Fishbone diagrams. And um, what's shown here is our five whys, which is what we kind of refer to as our fishbone turned sideways. And what our, fi our, our five whys analysis showed um, is that it, it, it helped us narrow down to three main areas. So the first focused on technology access, the second on the lack of standardized CGM educational materials, um, and then the last was that the fact that many of our public health patients did not know um, anyone else um, with type 1 diabetes who are undergoing the same struggles. Um, now, with these five whys and with all of the fish bones, we then um, proceeded to uh, construct our key driver diagram. And this is just a subset of our key drivers, which really highlights uh, the drivers and the interventions that we move forward with in terms of interventions. So I want to point out a couple of things. First, you notice that our SMART goal was actually a SMART-T goal um, with an IE. Um, this is something that Barbara brought to our group, suggesting that um, if we're thinking about uh, health equity and if we're thinking about disparities, we really also need to include efforts to be inclusive, which is the I, and equitable, which is the E as well. So on our uh, key driver diagram, the selected diagram, um, there were two main drivers. The first is that our families and patients feel supported in culturally sensitive age appropriate ways. And the second is that diabetes technology is available and used effectively by all. Um, and we have a note on this slide that, that really in, with the second driver, um, the focus is on techquity, which you may have heard is the, the strategic development and deployment of technology to advance equity. Um, so the two PDSAs that we'll talk about, or I'll talk about today, are two. Um, one is to establish a buddy mentor program, and the second is a, C a patient education handout um, on CGM. And I'm actually going to talk about that second one first. So for our PDSA uh, number one, um, this was the creation of the CGM educational handout. Um, this, our plan was to basically create this handout with, which was available both in hard copy as well as an electronic smart phrase or a text phrase that we could electronically enter into the after visit summary for our video visits. Um, we conducted two week cycles. So the first uh, cycle was back in September of 2021, where we made the handout available in exam rooms um, to be used as a discussion tool for patients with type 1 diabetes who are not using CGM. 
Um, and this was first piloted um, with a handful of our task force members, so six of our task force members. And then in our second cycle, um, we uh, repeated that, extended a bit. And then once we were comfortable with the fact um, that the handout was working, um, oh, there is my note that the breakout rooms are closing. I hope, am I gonna, I don't know if I'm gonna get cut off, but I'll keep talking. <laughs> um, uh, we adopted that to expand, uh, again, for, for use with all of our diabetes team members. We included that in the new patient packet, and then we also translated um, that handout into Spanish as we further adopted that intervention. Um, so you can see here is our run chart shown in gray is what I showed you before um, what was going on um, in the previous financial year. We started the project, created our handouts, and we had still some stochasticness of our, our gap um, in A1C uh, between our publicly and privately insured patients. Um, for the next PDSA, we wanted to be sure uh, to take a step back and really think about what um, Jeff brought up at the beginning of the session, capturing our patient voice. I think that was in the session, or maybe it was another session. Um, and I know some of the 